Hey, we're a couple minutes. We're a couple minutes after. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, everyone, hey, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, thanks for kind of showing up. But this may end up being more of a niche topic. I'm not sure how many healthcare uh, IT professionals are here, or healthcare leaderships here. Um, but I, I hope kind of the message is probably applicable across most domains. This is my first time kind of in a in a broader group. I typically have kind of worked mostly with some healthcare conferences and whatnot. So open to feedback and suggestions. Um, anyways, hey, my name's Chris Schmidt. I'm manager of information security at Greenville Health System. We're a, a decent sized healthcare organization in the upstate of South Carolina. Um, with me here is uh, Terry Jolly. He's one of my uh, team members here, one of the seniors on the team. Uh, his background's predominantly EPIC, um, and we've been bringing him in with his EPIC experience into our identity access management portfolio. Um, really, again, just for the benefits that it provides for our provi healthcare providers, our clinicians, employees, and whatnot. Um, really quick, I mean, our, our hospital facility, um, we're academically affiliated, so we've got a, we've got a diversity of students, uh, residents, um, as well as employees that span across seven hospitals in the upstate area. We have about 180 physician practices, so we've got a lot of connectivity around. We've got a lot of people. Ultimately, there's about... Um, 15,000 employees. Uh, we onboard probably 50 to 60 new employees each week, terminate about 40. Um, a lot of turnover and rollover in healthcare. It's fun to keep up with. Um, specialty, urgent care, and we're about a $2.5 billion in revenue organization. Um, up until about Friday at 3 o'clock, when we all just found out we're merging with, um, we're in the upstate South Carolina, we're merging with the largest provider. And you probably see this in healthcare a lot, a lot of it merging. But we're merging with um, the largest provider in the Midlands, the Columbia, South Carolina area. So um, the timing is great because there's two disparate systems that are going to want to have access to each other's uh, information in the, uh, for patient care, for revenue cycle and whatnot. So it was good to kind of have that going into this weekend for us to kind of explore some of the vendors. <coughs> um, and a lot of this presentation has nothing to do with that announcement. So um, I begin this journey about some of our challenges about four or four and a half years ago at our organization. Um, we had significant turnover in information technology leadership um, where we brought in, we, we had new leadership that brought in new goals, primarily focused around customer service, around accessibility, um, providing the tools that our, our caregivers need to support our patients. Um, so some of the things we kind of, we were struggling with, we had multiple sources of users. Like I said, we're academically affiliated. So we have residents that come in through spreadsheets. We have employees that come in through an HRIS system. Um, external contractors that come in and we have no, you know, no idea, no inventory of where they were coming in from. And we were expecting probably 50% growth on our user base at that time. So, I mean, people were coming on board. They needed to access the stuff. And again, our, our biggest concern is HIPAA and the ability to provide accountability disclosures for patient records. Um, in addition, lack of directory services maturity, it wasn't really taken care of. There was no logical structure just in our AD tree. So people, people in IS were in about four or five different locations for whatever reason. Um, so we, we felt that was kind of a thing we needed to clean up. Access delays too. When I first got there, it took three to five days just to get somebody an account, just to get them their email. Um, get them access to whatever tools they need. And we have about 400 applications in healthcare. I talk about Epic. Epic consolidated only about 37 out of those 400. Um, and oftentimes, the access given was inappropriate. This is probably the IDM story for everybody, right? Um, and our customers hated it. They, it was a joke. They knew when they came on board, the new employees, they say, oh, you're not going to be able to do anything for three or five days. So, so those were our challenges that we wanted to address. Um, at the same time, we went in and kind of brought in some other tools, too. So um, we started to go down the road of the IT service management. We were bringing in service now. So what, and the goal for that strategically was single portal interface for all of your support questions, all your needs, all your change controls, all your access requests and whatnot. Um, so we, we piggybacked on that when we started developing our IDM uh, strategy here. Um, we thought it'd be great to kind of leverage what people are used to or getting used to where people are getting trained on. Um, and also we had some projects kind of just simplifying the infrastructure. 30, out of the 37 systems that Epic came in and replaced, 11, we had 11 different EMRs. 
None of them were integrated with Active Directory, so p users had 11 passwords. Um, and they probably all used password123 because who wants to remember 11 passwords? So we were simplifying our infrastructure, specifically with Epic as well. Um, and we took the mindset that IT wanted to be the business enabler. You know, we didn't want to be the no shop. We didn't want to be involved in anything other than giving you guys, our customers, the tools to say, I want this, boom, it's done. We wanted to pull the IT people out of that process, the, manuals, the manual work effort out of those processes. So those are kind of our strategic goals going into this whole thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and again, you know, just the workflow started off with integration of our service management tool against ServiceNow. We got that deployed out. We got our end users customer uh, comfortable with that tool. And that's a difficult tool if anyone's used it to kind of really get comfortable with. Um, in parallel, we were doing our, the RFP for Identity Access Management Suite, and we sent that out to 11 vendors, went through that process, down-selected. Um, and while we were doing that, too, we were basically in, integrating um, or building out our Epic environment. And that was a two-year project for us. Um, and again, it, that took uh, somewhere upwards of probably two, 300 staff just to build that out as well. And still, Epic's, Epic is, um, their predominant workflow is still manual processes for provisioning accounts. Um, <clears throat> um, but then we ended up, what we wanted to do is kind of close, out the, uh, close it out with the integration of identity access management and, and the Epic workflow. Um, after we down selected, I'll say we had a little bit of tr trouble with some professional services uh, with that vendor. And fortunately, a vendor here came in and helped us out, so I'll give them a little plug. What, what took them nine months to do, they, um, that, that vendor here helped us out in about a month to go live. Um, at this point, so I'm gonna ask Terry to kind of talk about the Epic automation. Good morning, everybody, I'm, I'm TJ. Um, so I started out with Epic about four years ago, and I, I realized an issue that we had, um, and it's one of the problems that Chris had when he got to our health system was, we had four people doing the manual provisioning of 15,000 people, 7,000 externals, and whoever else is coming in at any, any point. And it's a slow process. We had anywhere from five to 10 days uh, turnaround time on that, and it was costing us money and a lot of uh, good PR. So I started working with Chris's, Chris's team about three years ago on how we could make this faster. So uh, one, of the, one of the first things we did uh, was we went out and we went to the actual end users. Because before we were doing, OK, are you a nurse? Or are you a doctor? Uh, all right, we're going to guess you're going to get this template. So we went out and we did a full mapping. Uh, we had every manager and director in our, our facility involved with this and a lot of IT. And, and we, we basically made them agree this is what everyone should get, role-based. Uh, once we did that, we went into a there's, there's no good solution. Again, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back a little bit. There's no, there was no good solution. We talked to Duke. We talked to many large facilities, and there was no automation for Epic. They had 10, 15, 20-person teams. Here in Chicago, we actually had a guy on our team from Chicago. They had 21 people on their team. They just, every day, was, was uh, manually uh, provisioning people, creating their, their, their access. So uh, once we got that template mapping, we just did basic scripting. Uh, uh, with PowerShell. We set up timed PowerShell scripts to hit and bounce things off onto a file transfer. Once they hit the file transfer, we had batch processes in Epic pick this up. So we completely automated all of Epic without a solution. Now the problem with that is if one piece broke, uh, you basically broke the whole solution. So we started working with our identity management system and we integrated that in. We, we did that through the use of APIs that Epic finally put out there. And once we did this, we worked with uh, their software guy for about six months. So now, instead of having five different processes, they've integrated all those processes into our identity management. So I don't know, does anybody here work with Epic? A couple guys. So um, one of the things we're doing is we, we're creating the SER, we're creating the EMP, and we're linking that each other it, all in one smooth process now, working through the identity management. Uh, and the way they're doing that was the, is with the template mapping on both sides based on department, job code, based on job title, and uh, a, a numbering system that we created up uh, because to link it, you actually have to know what the numbers are ahead of time. You can't just you know, guess what that is. So 
when we worked with our engineer, he created a product with us through this identity management company um, that, uh, it, it, but through the API, it goes in and it keeps record. It's constantly searching through a connector saying, hey, what do you have? Who's this person? Do they have the right uh, template, job code, SER? And if they job, change job codes or anything like that, it automatically changes that for us. It automatically links the SER. Uh, and again, we're doing that through uh, a mapping. So let's look right here. So the way we're doing it now, with anybody that's employed, this is coming through our, our, our M4 product, which is our HR and payroll. Uh, so their information comes in. It goes in, creates exchange, all of their attributes in AD. And also, it goes through our identity, man identity management system, and it will create the MP and the SER. Our big problem came with the externals, though. Uh, and with the externals, we started this with our ServiceNow product, which is our, our ticketing product. Uh, so we created a process where it's actually pulling in their external information, storing our, our external database. Uh, still going through the same process with our identity management, but uh, it, it's automatically creating with about, a, say, about a two-minute drag time on that? Yeah, about, about two minutes. Uh, with that, we're incorporating our credentialing system for anybody who's a physician or above, uh, just to get the right information in there. Uh, wins. Yeah. I'll bring Chris back up. So, kind of went through this really quick, but in the end, what what's this about? For us, it was about um, predominantly really customer customer service, customer satisfaction, and really getting people into what's appropriate. Um, but also, you know, people, they love seeing savings. So when I t remember when I talked about manual provisioning, originally our processes took three to five days. We had a team of five people doing that. Um, so we were able to effectively cut four of those positions out. Now, transfer them into different roles or whatnot, but, you know, we cut four of those positions in that, in that role out at the average salary, about $42,000 a year. Um, <clears throat> and like t uh, TJ said, you know, some Epic teams have provisioning man, or manually provisioning with teams of 21. We had about four. We were able to kind of effectively take two of them out and bring them more into different roles within the organization. And they have a little bit higher salary. But I mean, there, there's an immediate direct financial impact to our organization just by doing this. And that probably pays about um, half your IDM environment. Um, the other savings is on productivity. And if I was probably better prepared, I might be able to come up with some numbers. but. Before, before the implementation, especially around the external workflow, we'd always get calls up. I have a contract nurse at 60 bucks an hour sitting there because they have no access to something. Um, calling the help desk, getting, getting it to the right people is a four to, eight hour, four to eight hour minimum probably process. So you take those, those costs, the departments are bearing the cost of that. We've been able to significantly reduce, near eliminate that workflow as well. So contractors are able to come in, the managers are able to submit the request, and the workflow kicks off everything they need and communicates that out. There's no person, no IS involved. Um, and with, the, with that, by taking IS out of those, those processes and, and enabling the end users to put in the requests, put in the access that they needed, we've uh, significantly improved our customer satisfaction scores with them as well. So um, with that, um, that kind of I got one thing I want to oh. bring back up to. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about money savings. Uh, we, we saved a small amount with the actual provisioning team, with our actually IT practitioners. Where we really saved a lot of money was days on hand. The automatic creation of SCR, we were going out 30, 45 days on the creation of external providers, our ordering, um, attending, uh, referring providers. If they weren't in the system, not there, didn't have the right privileges, we had things that were setting in a queue 45, 90 days, 180 days. We had $3.8 million that could not process, could not be sent out to bill because the provider didn't have the right attributes. By automating, we cut it down to like three days. Um, there's still things that has to be done manually, but, but that's a lot of money we were losing. After 90 days, you really can't send those bills out at some point, so you lose that money. Uh, so we saved a little bit in, in our, our staffing model. We saved a lot in our billing model. All right, I'm going to walk around if anybody has questions or you got all the epic skills. Huh. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I mean, he's going to bring the microphone, so it, it's recording, so I'm going to hear. I have a question about your 7,000 externals. So when you're importing data of documents, is that to create a new, a, a new identity? Is 
about your 7,000 externals, when you're importing that data, are you creating new identities within your system for them that they can then inhabit, or are you actually accepting a third-party credential from some other source? Uh, are you talking about Insta Epic? Uh, yes, in your, in, your, in your system, yes. It is, are are you, HR, uh, we're, no, we're not creating a, a, a new one. We're actually using the same AD credentials that we would have in, in, our, in our identity management uh, to create them. But each, each individual application does have its own like provisioned, I, I, I guess the word is user, inside each system. Um, but I, it's going to be used the same credentials. So but it's a credential you create. It's not one that is from another, another body elsewhere, like a, um, like a federated credential of some sort. It's not like that at all. Not yet. Not yet. How do you, how do you see that playing out? And also, do, are any of your 7,000 externals, are they, are they any of them consumers, people who are looking for their records, that kind of thing? Uh, can you repeat that? I I'm sorry, of your 7,000, how do you see it playing out where you might accept third party credentials or you know, a, a federated credential somehow? And are any of your 7,000 externals, are any of them patients? Seventh on externals, um, yeah, we actually have something called MyChart, so they do have access to that, but it, it's, that is a separate uh, authentication. He can talk more about without one. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I can add to that. So, no, uh, we want to get out of that business of creating the credentials. So we want, we're, we're trying to figure out a roadmap or a way to integrate um, third-party federated uh, authentication. Um, not, not necessarily for patients, but for all these contract resources. Um, we're not at that point yet. We're, we know, but strategically, that's where we want to go. Because right now, the way we collect all the information on externals to validate their ID, to protect them, um, to protect uh, our patients on the, the accounting and disclosures and whatnot, we're collecting information we don't want to have, but we have to have it to validate them. So, um, so the, that, that's, in our, that's kind of one of the things we're strategically looking at. But we're not there yet. But if you have suggestions, let us know. <laughs> all right. Right behind you, Chris. So for those 7,000, is any portion of those, uh, of that population, um, practitioners of any sort who might be engaging with patients and therefore be subject to joint or other accreditation body credentialing requirements? Yes. If so, then how would you manage the federation component in order to val validate not just identity, but com comprehensive background checks for privileging, et cetera, et cetera? A lot of that's actually handled through our um we have two separate models. We have what we call Community Connect, uh, and we also have our credentialed providers who are brought in through our credentialing system uh, through our med staff department. Community Connect, we're actually selling out our services to other hospitals, uh, uh, doctor's office, physician practices, and it's really a trust is what we're running with them. And those services are exclusively within the state, or do you go uh, tele outside of the state? Currently, we're just in the state, but we will be moving out of the state soon. We're, we're, we're constantly expanding. And to answer your question, this, this, what Chris mentioned earlier, we actually our biggest merger so far happened Friday. So we, we have a lot of questions that we're going to have to answer for ourselves coming up with the federation of the two different systems. One of the systems we just merged with is on Cerner, and we're on Epic. So we have a lot of questions how we're going to make that interact ourselves. You know? uh, have you also automated your deprovisioning, and how do you handle um, emergency terminations? I, I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Have you also automated your deprovisioning, and how do you handle uh, emergency terminations? The deprovisioning is actually handled through our AD, not in Epic. Um, yes, that is automated. Um, an emergency, uh, we have about a 15 second like turn time. If you put in a ticket for a, a, a uh, extermination, we do have, well, it goes through, but we have 24 hours to make sure they can finish their shift. If there's an emergency termination, we're contacted by our HR and we, we do that by hand. No other question. Uh, you go. Yeah, well, it's my, it's a small question about the uh, template. Your uh, title does that refer to a history role, or do you define your roles in an artifact sense uh, independently? Uh, well, right now it's limited, but we're actually doing that just by a title at the moment because our externals uh, they fit into a very specific uh, set, and what we we have like a, a mapping set out there for it. 
uh, and we let our actual Epic security team uh, fill that in and grow it as it gets. So right now we have a not listed. So if you don't have one, we have 40 some odd different titles because the majority of the people we have externals that come in that are that really need uh, urgent access, you know, are going to be like our traveling nurses, our PCTs. We, we're paying somebody $50 an hour to do a $20 an hour job and they're here and they can't get access kind of things. Uh, but it is right now it's currently for externals, it's by by actually a name that they choose, like an actual name, we map it off. For any internals, it's, it's based off a department ID and a job code. Yeah, it, it, I mean, Kaiser's a big customer of yours, and uh, it limits the, their interoperability and ability to share health information. I'm confused. Does the company have a plan towards moving towards more standards based? So I'm not actually with Epic. I, I work with Epic in our system. Um, but to answer that, um, yeah, actually they do. That's part of why they're opening up the APIs and giving more access internally, so we can, you know, you can share amongst the, the systems. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Doctor, doctor uh, nurse-related experiences as far as interacting with the computer systems as they're walking the floors in a hallway. You know, what have you done to try to enable them from? Either they're using badges or every time they're walking into a new room and having to log into new terminals, right? What have you guys done to you know, so, improve their daily experience? Um, so we've been piloting Improvada for pretty much from a badge like a single sign-on perspective. Um, there's been talks about some biometrics. Uh, that's probably more down the road because there's investments in, with, our, with our deployed out hardware, there'd be investments we'd have to make. Um, Improvada, we've already kind of made the investments. Um, at this point, we've not really rolled it out. Is there a, I don't know, doctors carrying their own iPads, everyone has their own affiliation coming into the hospital that you guys have to support, you know, n number of sort of um, We do have a BYOD strategy. It's very limited in deployment or in use. Um, pretty much for Epic, we've got hard-mounted workstations and areas, and they, the physicians do have laptops that are, the organization provides. Our employer, I mean, we employ probably 95% of the uh, physicians that practice with us. Gotcha. And so with the revolving, I guess, resident slash university related affiliations that you guys have, you mentioned automated termination or automated deprovisioning and whatnot. Is that because you set up a period of time when you created their account and they're automatically going to be provisioned or how do you guys sort of get the roster that, hey, yes, this person graduated or this person moved out of residency and no longer needs access? We, you, so for okay, residents, yeah. yeah, we know the term in which we're going to apply, so we do expire out their accounts. But if they become staff, um, we'll catch that in the HRIS as it's entered in or in the credentialing system, and we'll, we'll remove that termina or that, that account expiration. And it's a mandatory part of the ticket also. How long does this person have access, and the longest we give access for is a year um, if you're not employed by us. Yeah, I mean, our, our only safeguard for externals because we still – We've been uh, struggle with the inventory is we expire all external accounts by default after a year, unless they give us an expiration date and a contract that we can tie to it. So, yep. any other questions? Do you guys deal with substance abuse, mental health, uh, sensitive protections? Yes. We yes. Or into CFRs, I think. Yeah, we, we, um, in Epic, we have what they call break the glass, and it monitors every time someone even touches a patient. It's not just substance abuse. It's, it could be, all right, you, you know, you're a rock star and you're staying in our hospital. Anytime somebody even thinks to look at that, we have uh, protection that, that basically logs and monitors. Every time you've looked at it, when you did break the glass, how long you were in it, what you looked at, I mean, basically it creates a video you know, of, of what you did. Uh, for, I, I'd say like our employee, our employee side where it's, um, I can't think of the name of them right now, but like if, if, if we had somebody that had an issue, like, you know, they, they had to go into a drug program or something like that, that's actually kept um, on paper. We've got, they don't want that in the system uh, because, they, 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 I mean, you can access it at any point in Epic. You can get to it, doesn't, because it's monitored doesn't mean you can't get to it. You can go through all the loop, you know, the hoops and loops to get to what you want to, but um, yeah, they, they don't want that anywhere in, in the system. Yeah, we have a pretty comprehensive internal audit program. We have a team of group people who go out there, they look for inappropriate access, yeah. and they pull the random audits and whatnot, too. So, uh, yep. 
When you were doing your role mapping, how much of the time were you actually spending going towards who could request and authorize access versus the actual roles themselves? Who could re um, well, and we actually spent a lot of time on that. Um, uh, once we got it approved, we don't, we don't have a lot of that anymore. Uh, one of the problems with Epic, I don't know if you guys work with Epic, is uh, they're very proud of their system. You can expand and create multiple templates so people could have multiple roles at the same time. The problem is once you do that, uh, the person has to log in and out each time to use that different role to do their job. Um, so part of that was condensing all that. So we didn't have to have people asking us for extra access, whatever. It's just there. Here's the keys. We're going to trust you not to go into that room kind of thing. So, so if you're a nurse, you're going to have all of the, the tools you need to be a clinician but don't go acting like you're performing plastic surgery. Yeah, I mean, we, ba we, we base template and base approved certain things. So if they're, if they're mapped out and known, then we don't have any ex, uh, extra approval process. If it's a request outside of a scope, then we go through management chain. And approvals. it's part of the ticket for extra and, access. Yeah. It's not automated. Your manager has to approve your ticket anyway. But with that, it sounds like we've got to wrap things up. So, um, oh, yeah? yeah. Huh? OK, go ahead. Oh, OK. Uh, appreciate everyone's time. I uh, hope something um, you guys got something out of this. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.